Before we get into today's awesome conversation, I'd like to just give you a little primer on something that we've been working on hard behind the scenes at High Existence, and that is the second iteration of The Ascent, our flagship course on how we can follow our bliss, destroy internal obstacles, and achieve the life that we've always dreamed of but never had the courage to attain. A lot of us who are already knowledgeable about self-improvement have learned various kinds of tools about managing stress and anxiety, overcoming negative moods, optimizing our health and sleep, and all of these kinds of life basics. And when we first discover methods to do this, it's very exciting and almost addictive. But then when we do it, we have to ask the question, what are we going to do with this new way of being? What are we going to do and where are we going to go with this vehicle that we've been working on? Simply obsessing over self-improvement is like polishing a car over and over again, making it look better, making it run better, making it run smoother and faster. But what is a car for? A car is for driving, going places, going from A to B, or racing, or maybe a car can be used as a camper van. There are many different uses for a vehicle just as there are many different uses for self-improvement. Life is an adventure. We are exploration-seeking creatures. It's very tempting to let our self-improvement tools and techniques become ornaments. We are collecting different tools, different pieces of equipment, but we're not actually taking that climb. And that's what the Ascent program is all about. In the Ascent, you get to join us, the entire High Existence team, alongside extremely committed individuals, and we are going to work together to take strides towards attaining those goals that you've always wanted to achieve, whether that be starting a business, a blog, a podcast, creating a course, starting a coaching business, making retreats, writing a novel, setting up an art exhibition. It doesn't matter what it is. There are typically two things that are holding you back. The first one is limiting beliefs and fear, and that will keep you procrastinating for literally decades if you let it. And the second thing is strategy. If you don't know what's possible, if you don't have a plan to go from where you are now to making an income online or getting a book published, then all that's going to do, all that's going to do is feed in to the limiting beliefs and procrastination you already have. The Ascent is a program to shake that up, to make a change. If this sounds interesting to you, then I'm going to give you the link to apply for this program. After you apply, you'll have a chance to arrange a call with one of the High Existence team members to see if we can work together and to see if your goals and aims align with the purpose of the Ascent. It is not for everyone. It is not just another self-improvement course. You can visit highexistence.com forward slash ascent dash live. That's highexistence.com forward slash ascent dash live. There will also be a link in the show notes of this episode. The Ascent is starting in just a few weeks. So if you're listening to this and this appeals to you, apply it right now before you listen to the rest of the episode. Now, with that said, let's get into today's conversation. Welcome to the High Existence Podcast. This is your host, John Brooks, and today I am speaking to Johnny Miller. Johnny is the founder of the Curious Humans Podcast and monthly newsletter, as well as being a breathwork facilitator, meditation teacher, and emotional resilience coach. Something that is notable to mention here, Johnny is the creator of something called Nervous System Mastery, which is incredible. In this episode, we talk about grief as a gateway to the inner hero's journey, how Johnny became a successful digital nomad, advice for anyone wanting to start a podcast, how to heal the root of trauma, not just address the symptoms, breathwork for emotional resilience, Johnny's critique of stoicism. You know, I'm a big advocate of stoicism, but does it mean that stoicism is perfect just because I like it? Of course not. There are definitely areas to improve and innovate in this philosophy. We also talk about how to remain energized and calm throughout the day, as well as finding the right mentor 
and much more. We've decided to make the show notes for this episode particularly rich. So if you check out the show notes for this episode, depending on where you're watching it or listening to it, you can also check out highexistence.com and find this podcast in the podcast section. You'll find a ton of links that you can explore. It's, uh, it's going to take you a little bit of time, but it's going to be totally worth it. As always, if you like this episode, remember to subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave a review. It really helps us. Much appreciated. Here is my conversation with Johnny Miller. So, hey, Johnny, thank you for uh, taking some time to talk to me um, on the High Existence podcast. Um, I want to start by asking you why you got interested in resilience, because I've looked Mm -hmm. over your emotional resilience report, and it's really fascinating. I haven't seen anything like it before. You mentioned burnout a lot in it. Um, and I think burnout is a very important topic. It's a topic close to my heart. I've seen family members become ill from it, um, but Mm. it isn't talked about that much. So what got you interested in resilience? Mm. Okay, well, I guess we'll we'll dive in the deep end (laughs) right away. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, my background was as a startup founder. Um, I, I found, co-founded a company called Maptia about 10 years ago. Um, and about four and a half years into that journey, uh, we were working remotely and I just got to this place where, um, I just didn't feel like myself and it was, there were a number of different challenges going on at the time. Um, but I, I definitely went through this, you know, f- fairly intense, but also prolonged burnout period that led to me leaving the company and just kind of really stepping away to figure out what, what was it that I actually wanted to do. Um, but the to kind of get to your question, um, the, the resilience work was really born from my process of navigating grief, um, which was uh, which which began just under four years ago when my my fiance at the time Sophie uh, she suffered from bipolar and she had an anxiety attack when she was working at a at a hospital and there wasn't great support there and she she came back home and she took her own life um, by overdosing on her medication and so the following weeks months and and years honestly were my my journey of of kind of going into myself and realizing how essentially numb I'd been from from the neck down and how disconnected from my own body I'd been and really allowing myself to feel the the depths of of the grief and and to kind of surrender to the pain that was there um and 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 really appreciating the the gift that lay on the other side which which sounds weird to say but it's definitely what i experienced um that was really what led me into this exploration and research of what i've been calling emotional resilience um which i've i've more recently been working with with founders and and leaders and people to kind of bring it into the work context but for me the the seed was really the process of grieving Mm. grief is it's something that from the outside if if you're not experiencing it it's very hard to relate to um when i've experienced deep episodes of grief I found that the the people that had gone through similar things, I was able to connect with them a lot more than people who'd never really gone through it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's yeah, it's yeah, it's obviously one of the the most difficult parts of being a human being, being alive, is experiencing grief. Just wondering, um, now four years later, do you have any um, sort of tips or ideas for people that are experiencing grief that might be helpful um based on Mm. your own journey yeah i i mean there's a few things that come to mind i think that the first one was was just a lesson of um not needing to go through the whole thing myself and kind of being being okay with asking me for help when i needed it um and i i think i'd been you know, in the startup world, there's this idea that we, we're, we're self-reliant, we're self-sufficient, we can get through everything on our own. 
but I think particularly in the in the weeks and months following um, following the loss, I just needed to have other people there and, and learning how to ask for help and asking for what I needed was was a definite lesson early on. Um, and then f for me, I was I was living in Brighton at the time, um, and I actually I used to go sea swimming, and this was kind of in the in the early winter, so kind of November December time. And for mm -hmm. me, getting up every morning at just before sunrise and going into the freezing ocean was was the most one of the most healing things that I that I experienced. And and it's it's interesting. I kind of as the months went on, I began to realize the connections between um, learning to feel into the, the freezing cold water and learning to feel the grief. And th there's almost this, this, this moment when you, I, I, I'm sure you've been swimming in cold water as well, but when you first mm -hmm. put your feet in and your, and your body first goes in, there's this initial shock and there's this pain and every, every fiber in your body wants to like turn around and get out and, and you're like, what the hell am I doing? Um, but I found yeah. that if I, if I sat with it and if I was able to kind of even like inquire into the nature of the, the physical sensation and soften into it, that um, it, would, it would just kind of dissipate and there would be this, um, this re real cathartic feeling. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very similar with grief as well. And so um, it, not so much tips that I can offer, but in, in terms of um, what really helped me was different practices and different modalities for getting into my own body and, and realizing um, realizing what I was holding and, and kind of cultivating this, this somatic self-awareness um, and, and learning to release it, learning to let it go. Um, for, for, for me, the, um, I, 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 yeah, I, I suppose I'll also add that in the, in the beginning, I'd, I'd seen other people, often older people, family members who had experienced loss but hadn't grieved sufficiently. It's like they were kind of bitter and they were still holding it in them and they, and they never fully recovered. And I think that we've mm -hmm. all probably seen people like that and it's, it's, it's really hard to see. Um, and so part of me, I didn't want to become like that person. And so in some ways I, I almost made the decision internally to face this head on and to kind of drop all the work I was doing and to really give myself the time to, to go through this process. And for me, this involved, um, I signed up for a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat in the UK um, and then had some plant medicine experiences, uh, drinking ayahuasca in the, in the years following um, and, and also got into, into breath work as well, which um, has made a profound difference in my life. But these, th these, these are kind of different, um, various different modalities. And I think each of them helped me in a, in a different way. Um, so yeah, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's just, I've got a few follow up questions on that. So one, the first one though, is an observation about, you, you said that you sometimes see people that hold on to the grief and don't seem to let it go. Mm. In my own experience dealing with grief, I found that there was a critical period soon after, say like one to three months after, where mm. everything was very, very, very raw. And I and I I faced my grief like very head on in that in that period. But then I found that after that critical period, you know, obviously life catches up with you. And there's sort of an emotional closing that happens. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't dealt with the grief within those first few months, or at least like tried to, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I can imagine it's much more difficult to kind of open up that Pandora's box like a year later mm -hmm. or two years later, you know, when you're busy and everything's going on and, you know, you want to kind of survive and you don't want to go back into difficult feelings. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that, that's, but you, that's a really, yeah, that's just, that's a really interesting observation. And what comes to mind for me, um, was in, in the case of losing Sophie, the, there was also for me this sense of like losing the imagined future that I'd created. And so, as you say, in the kind of, in the immediate aftermath in, in the weeks and maybe two or three months afterwards, there was this sense of, of not really having an identity to grasp onto of like who I was going to be in the future. And, and mm. I think that is that maybe contributes to the, 
the, the reason why there is such a large like like existential opening in that period where you can go really deep really quickly and it's certainly possible to process grief and loss in you know many months years even decades later because it is still stored in the nervous system but I, th I think you're right I think the kind of the weeks and months immediately following are it's just much more raw and much more alive yeah yeah um you mentioned uh going in into the cold water was that a conscious effort on on your path to you know use cold exposure was that something that you were intentionally doing or was it more like a you just noticed that the cold was making mm. you feel better yeah well actually it's it's something that um sophie and i we had like a morning ritual um normally in the summertime but we would go see swimming together and so i found myself kind of being pulled towards the places and the people that i associated most with her and being in the sea was was definitely one of those places and and so i think that was my that was my initial pull into it but after the first i guess the first couple of weeks i just realized the the profound healing effect that i think it was it was having on me um and so i think i kept going and you know in the years since i've i've learned a lot more about cold exposure and the the benefits but at the time i think i was just kind of following my intuition mm. cuz i know that wim hof he went into the cold primarily to work on his grief to to kind mm. of overcome it um mm. and mm. i also used cold exposure as a part of my uh, healing process from grief as well so mm. yeah it's it's interesting how it wasn't really something you were consciously doing for that reason but mm. it still had a useful effect mm. Mm. yeah, yeah. And, and just, um, just to kind of just to kind of drill in on that um i, I think there's there's something interesting about being able to really observe your body when it is in this very intense kind of fight or flight state and and i think that capacity to to witness our emotions and, and training that um, is maybe one of the one of the the skills of resilience that needs to be cultivated in order to to kind of move through um, difficult experiences like like grief and loss. Um, yeah, yeah. So you you got interested in breath work and you had some plant medicine experiences. If you go back, say a decade ago, were you interested in transformation and 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 resilience and becoming better um, or stronger then or is this more of a recent thing um so i let's see a decade ago so i i studied philosophy at university um primarily ethics and values and, and i think if i think about my my teenage years and my early 20s i was i was always fascinated by the human condition and, and kind of this question of like what does it mean to li to live well what does it mean to live a good life um, but I didn't really, I, I certainly, I wasn't really exploring it. Um, I, I wasn't exploring any specific practices or, or modalities. And, and I think, I feel like I, I've always cultivated this, um, this sense of adventure in my life. And for, from between kind of being 18 and, and 24, 25, I was, I was adventuring in the outer world, kind of going, um, traveling to various different places and, writing travel stories and connecting with travel photography and it felt like for me grief was almost a a tipping point where my my desire for adventure and my curiosity for the outside world was almost turned inwards and and i felt like i i was being invited to embody this courageous curiosity to to go on this inner adventure it, it, i i think about it like um almost like two heroes journeys where the the first hero's journey was was exploring the outside world and, and finding wonder and awe and rapture and, and, and beauty. And the hero's journey that I'm definitely still on is much more of an internal one and kind of charting the territory of my own internal landscape that I'd been completely oblivious to growing up in, in England, where we're you know, taught to be very kind of um, have a stiff upper lip, not really show our emotions, not really express anger, these kinds of things. Um, so that's how I've been thinking about it. I love those two hero's journeys, the outside and, and the internal, uh, because just reflecting on that, I think you can easily get stuck in just one or the other. 
mm-hmm. and then there are probably going to be complications as a result of that. Like if you're only focusing on the internal and you're just like ignoring the external or you're only focusing on the external and ignoring the internal. Mm. Yeah, I, I really like that approach. So you studied philosophy. Um, how did you, just going back, how did you go from studying philosophy to uh, creating online and becoming a digital nomad and going on these adventures oh man um so when i was uh when i was a student or before i went to university i'd I had a, a year out um, after school and i went on this 11 month uh extended backpacking trip through australia and indonesia and southeast asia and it really it really changed my perspective on the world in a lot of ways so while i was at university um i remember meeting uh, my who the two friends who went on to become my co-founders dorothy and dean i met them at a, a live music event and i think at this point we'd bored all of our friends with our, our travel stories and different places that we've been to um and so finding someone else who was equally fired up about travel and exploration we just talked for like three hours straight um this then led to starting a travel magazine together in in durham university um Mm -hmm. and then just as um just as i was about to graduate they'd they'd already graduated and they they were backpacking down in argentina and they were couch surfing with a guy who turned out to be a haitian prince of, of sorts and he told them about a program called startup chile which was based in Santiago and it was a a very new government run business incubator that gifted or or gave grants of 40,000 US dollars to foreign entrepreneurs to fly to Chile and start a business. And so we like, we basically knew that we didn't want to go get a job in the city, which is kind of what a lot of graduates from Durham were being funneled into. Um, And so we Mm -hmm. thought, you know, what the hell we'll, we'll give it a shot. And so we, we put together a, um, business plan competition, knowing very little, like ridiculously little about startups or business at the time. Um, Dorothy taught herself to animate. Uh, we, Dean recorded a little song for the intro video <laughs> and we sent it off. Um, and then I think three months later, we heard back from them and we found out that we got in. And so wow. um, we ended up flying to Santiago for this six month accelerator, which was really our, um, our kind of education in the business world learning from like 250 other entrepreneurs from all around the world and we then built the the foundations of, of Maptia um, which was this travel storytelling company and from there we then were accepted into Techstars which is another tech accelerator um, and then the the business kind of took off from there. Yeah uh, well I mean that story there has so many um, like you can learn so much from that the the fact that you took a leap of faith you went into something you didn't really know much about mm-hmm. um you had trust that, w- that it would work out because i meet um pe- people that read high existence a lot and there's a deep yearning to kind of like you back then kind of like avoid the the path that other people lay out for them and to kind of go their mm-hmm. own way and find freedom and meaningful work so yeah it's that's one of the reasons i asked this because that's very inspiring i think mm. Mm. That initial story. And, and to, just to kind of highlight something i think that for us um it was more about the the process and we knew that even if the business was going to fail uh, that we would learn so much from the process and that it would you know lead to so many other opportunities and create so much serendipity which it, which it has done for for all of us and so I, I think we viewed it as almost like an extension of our education um, and we were really fortunate that there was a government that was willing to you know pay for our our living costs and our food um, at the same time. Yeah, that's awesome. So valuing education and connection more than like one specific, you know, lump of cash or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, because that's like, that's more of a long game. And so where did you go from there to what you do now? And if you could just explain what you're currently working on as well. Mm. Um, I know you have a lot in the works. Yeah, sure. So, um, as I mentioned briefly in the beginning, um, about four and a half years into the the journey of building Maptia, um, I went through this this burnout um, that was uh, just essentially coming from a realization that 
even though I really believed in the mission and I deeply loved my two co-founders, um, the, the work that I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis wasn't filling me up. It wasn't exciting me. I was essentially just sending a lot of emails, managing community. Um, and th there was a quote from, I believe it's Annie Dillard, and she says, how we spend our days is in the end how we spend our lives. And I remember mm -hmm. reading that and just being like, oh shit, I, I, <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to move on. I need to do something else. Um, and and it, it had very much been my identity up until that point as well. Like I'd never had another job. Um, and I, my, my self-worth in many ways was wrapped up in this idea of being a co-founder of this, this beautiful tech company. Um, so I stepped away. Um, I was living in London at the time. And I think a few weeks after that, a, a good friend of mine invited me to be a mentor for their, their startup accelerator in London run by Escape the City. And I really enjoyed that process. And at the end of that cohort, they invited me to be a, a um, like they called it a tribe leader, which is essentially a facilitator for the program and helped to design the curriculum for that. And so I spent the next kind of two and a half to three years um, working a, like alongside that company and teaching this startup curriculum to uh, mostly people who'd had city jobs for 5, 10, 15 years and wanted to do something that was more fulfilling, more exciting, um, more creative. And so mm -hmm. that was a really, really fascinating and really fun uh, job. And I, I think during the process, I learned how much I enjoyed teaching and facilitating and kind of um, and speaking on stage too. I'd never really done much, much speaking before. Um, so that lasted for about three years. And then uh, that was when Sophie took her life. Um, and <clears throat> from then on, um, I, I moved away from London. I've kind of spent a lot of time in, I went back to Bali, spent time in Morocco. Um, and then in the last couple of years, I've been, I guess, re-emerging back, back into the world, um, doing a mixture of coaching with startup founders. Um, I've been running uh, emotional resilience workshops which begun as a uh, collaboration with a friend called Jan Chipchase um, and basically designing this uh, three-day masterclass to teach some of the principles of emotional resilience. And we've been running that uh, about three times a year. Um, there are some retreats in the works. And uh, more recently, I've been working on a curriculum called Nervous System Mastery, which is essentially taking some of these principles of um, breathwork, of, pran of pranayama, and of recent science about the nervous system to to regulate our emotions and to be able to um, kind of achieve our desired state. So if we're feeling anxious, how can we down-regulate our nervous system to feel a sense of calm? And if we're maybe feeling sleepy or tired, how can we, you know, fairly quickly without taking coffee, um, feel mm -hmm. energized and, and feel good again? Um, and then on the side, I've also been, uh, I started a project called Curious Humans, which is... Um, begun as a newsletter, just me sharing my journey, me kind of talking about some of the things I was, I was experiencing. Um, and then out of that was born the podcast, which has been probably the most rewarding project that I've, I've worked on in the last, last few years. And just, I, I'm sure similar to you, just the, the, the chance to have fascinating conversations with people that are interesting. And for me, learning more about what it means to be, to be a, a man in the world, what it means to be an embodied leader, um, and just exploring some of these questions that are very alive for me. Wow. Yeah, that's, you, you definitely do have a lot of luck going on. I, my first thought is I would love to attend um, a retreat that you run at some point. Mm. That would be awesome. Um, be there. <laughs> your, your newsletter is amazing. It's like, it's always something that I like to read and, and the podcast is great. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the podcast that you, that you have. What is your, what is your approach to having meaningful conversations? Do you have a, a certain like kind of checklist or like w just what is your, your approach to, to speaking with people in your mm. podcast? Hmm. Great question. Um, I, I think that it has to start first and foremost with like a real desire and fascination to, speak to the person that, that I'm that I'm interviewing um, and I think that the best conversations are born from that kind of just burning desire whether it's respect and admiration or just you know interest in, in whatever this person's up to um, 
but I, I think as I look back, I've done about 31 episodes now. Um, the episodes that really had an impact on me were the ones where I, I felt like I was in the presence of, of an elder in, in some form. Um, I remember interviewing um, a poet called David White. Um, this was actually in person on the west coast of Ireland um, during one of his, his walking tours. And we were sitting in a, in a cabin, there was drinking whiskey, there was like a, a log fire. <laughs> and I felt like I was just in the presence of, of a genuine elder. Um, and I think that for me, I imagine this, this resonates with members of your community too, but I didn't feel like I had that many role models growing up. And, and I didn't mm. really know what it meant to be a, a good human. Um, and I think that in, in meeting David White and, and some people I've spoken to since, I kind of got a glimpse of, of almost the human that I aspire to be, or at least he was embodying certain qualities that really resonated with me. And then his voice is just has this, it kind of casts a spell when he talks. Um, and he has this incredibly palpable presence. Um, so that was one conversation that really stood out. And then... In, in terms of what makes what makes a good conversation, I think um, learning to learning to allow space for silence as well. I think and the the state in which you show up to a conversation, I think, makes a big impact. Um, I also tend to do a, a lot of reading and research before before conversations. Um, and and you know, if if they have a book, I'll read the book. Maybe it sometimes two or three times taking a lot of notes and just really finding out like what what is the essence of the question that I want to ask and making connections that perhaps people who've talked to them previously haven't made um but I, th I think that the most the conversations that felt like they, they had the most aliveness were with people like David White or Bill Plotkin or or Jamie Wheel more recently where I feel like this person is is embodying a degree of of elderhood or a degree of um the human that I aspire to be when I'm in my forties, fifties, sixties. Yeah. Wow. Damn. <laughs> those are some, <laughs> some good pointers going to be reflecting on those. And uh, just, um, I'd, I'd, yeah, just, just before we, I'd be curious to hear what your answer to that would be as well. Like what, what have you learned from these conversations? Yeah. Um, so I see, I see, um, I, I, I like this idea of, of being like tactically selfish. So, mm. you know, for example, if you're in, if you're in love, you kind of want to be a bit selfish, right? You, you, you kind of want to be like, I, I want you to be with me because I, I really love you. And, and it's not like selfishness in a way that lacks compassion. It's more just like, yeah, I really like being around you. Um, mm. And what I think about with, with the podcast is, oh, wow, I have an opportunity selfishly to try and learn for myself, um, to try and meet people that can inspire me. Like I'm learning a lot from talking to you. And I believe that in kind of selfishly going after these gems, other people will, will also benefit from it. If I, if I approach these conversations as I'm not going to care about myself, but I'm just going to ask questions and talk about things that other people might want to hear. Mm. Well, first of all, I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. And and second of all, I'm not really going to be asking those questions and going into those areas that that are really kind of important to me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I I'm kind of seeing this as an opportunity to kind of get therapy myself or learn the things that <laughs> yeah. I want to learn, and then other people can experience that process and hopefully benefit from it too. Mm. So that's, yeah, I that's my I really love that. And and I think it kind of comes back to trusting the process. And, and when you say tactically selfish, I think of like selfish, but you're, you're like you're a higher version of yourself maybe as well, where you're trusting your intuition as opposed to the, yeah. the, the ego self that might be like, oh, I need to ask them these questions that my audience wants to hear. But um, that rarely leads to the questions that have the most aliveness or like the real gems. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I think you can, you can differentiate between like ego selfishness or not when you can kind of tell people what you're up to like I just did. And you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's clearly mm -hmm. like mutually beneficial. There's not, nothing yeah. shady going on. Yeah. And, and um, there's, there's one more thing that comes to mind. I, I think that, um, and I'm experiencing this myself as well, but I think there is a, a gift in, um, in being the recipient of that, um, of that intense curiosity and that fascination and that aliveness. Um, and I think that it, it, it sometimes, it sometimes creates, um, I almost think of some of the podcast conversations as almost like, um, a kind of talking meditation 
And I, I feel like some of the most profound conversations I've had in my life have been <clears throat> because of the podcast. And there's something yeah. about turning on a microphone and, and entering that deeper sense of presence that allows you to get into a state of flow. So I think that, like you say, it's, it's generative for both people. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things I, I really want to do is do podcasts with family members, you know, because there are so mm. many stories and, and things that people close to us have done. And we've never really just sat down and gone like, let's just talk mm. for three hours about all of that. Mm. You know, I so, love that. Yeah, I'd like to do that. And also for, for anyone who is curious and wants to start a podcast, you know, uh, because I do meet some people that have this aspiration. Um, like you just said, it's a, it's, it's an enjoyable process. You know, I, I think people put a lot of pressure on themselves, but people typically like, I like, um, doing podcasts. I like it. If, if someone wants to ask me questions, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, like you said, like a talking meditation. It's not something that it needs to be stressful or you need to put pressure on yourself about. Um, so yeah, in short, just, just go for it. If you have that aspiration, mm -hmm. I want to, um, go back to resilience a little bit. And so mm -hmm. one of the things I'm interested in is, is trauma. And mm -hmm. you've mentioned that you, you're interested in that too. Mm -hmm. And this idea that trauma lives in the body. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on, so let me just ground this. So say someone has experienced you know, trauma 10 years ago and they're living a life now where they, they have a lot going on, they have a lot of responsibilities and they're feeling close to burnout. They're white knuckling and kind of in survival mode. Mm -hmm. There are two approaches one could take. One could take a managing symptoms approach where you just try to calm them down, calm them down so that they can get through the day. But then another approach would be, well, let's go back to the source mm -hmm. of your trauma and deal with that. Mm -hmm. So just wondering your approach um, for helping people in such situations. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating topic and question. And I think there's a lot, of, um, a lot of science that's been, or a lot, of, a lot of studies that are being done at the moment, particularly at MAPS and Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm not sure if you saw... Gabo Mate's The Wisdom of Trauma as well. I thought that was a fantastic documentary. Um, and, and I think it's really important that this information is, is spread and becomes common knowledge. Um, so my, my kind of particular approach um, has, has been through, through breathwork and I've been fortunate to learn from and, and mentor or, or, or be mentored by um, trauma-aware breathworkers. Um, and like you say that this this particular type of breath work is is called conscious connected breathing it's a form of um transformational breathing similar to holotropic that other people might have heard of as well um and the basic idea is that when we when we experience something traumatic if we don't um process and and, and release the trauma shortly afterwards it will be stored in our nervous system. Um, and and there's, a, there's a really powerful video that listeners can look up. Um, if you just Google Impala trauma response on, or look on YouTube, um, there's a, a short clip of an Impala that is chased by a lion and it, it escapes with its life and it's kind of crouching behind a bush and it just starts to shake and its entire body just starts to convulse and this lasts for kind of 10, 15 minutes and then it gets up and walks away. Um, wow. And we have that exact same kind of physiology uh, built into our systems, but we're just not really taught how to process our traumas. So th to give an, another kind of concrete example, having, a, um, having an anesthetic after, say, a, a motorbike accident here is actually really bad for the body because it inhibits the natural kind of trauma reflex. And so all of us have these kind of micro and macro accumulated traumas that, we, that we're carrying that have come to us during the course of our lives um, and, and many of them are, are kind of unprocessed. And so what, what breath work allows, and you can also use things like somatic experiencing is, is a great form of therapy that does something similar, but breath work um, by breathing in very intensely and then having a relaxed exhale, um, it brings your body into a highly alkalized state, which essentially allows the, these traumas, which main, which, you know, may not even be in the conscious memory. They could even be um, kind of pre-verbal in the years between naught to three. 
um, and and they surface and they they can be f- they can be fully processed and um, guiding one one to one sessions I've seen people um, process experiences of drowning um, I, my, my mentors told stories about um, sexual traumas that have been released and essentially when if if the person is willing to kind of feel into whatever whatever's there the body will usually shake and convulse sometimes there's there'll be there'll be anger released sometimes there'll be grief um, and, and tears are shed and it's really this um very uh just just beautiful to witness process of the human body just releasing the emotion that it's been carried onto this kind of stored energy um and then usually after some release there's the the nervous system will drop into a parasympathetic state and it will kind of integrate and the nervous system will be like rewiring itself essentially and following this release and so i just as soon as i experienced this for myself i was just absolutely fascinated and i've um for me it's really been a tool for my own kind of self-exploration um and, and to give to maybe give a practical example to the grandness slightly um I've been, I've been working with the the, the, the male archetypes, king, warrior, magician, lover, um, mm-hmm. and realizing that for most of my life I've been very poor at uh, kind of setting boundaries and holding to them, and I and I've, I very rarely expressed anger. I kind of didn't think of myself as an angry person. I just thought I was very easygoing. Um, and during one of these breathwork journeys, there, w- there was a memory that surfaced of a, a fight that I had when I was younger. Um, where I just felt powerless and I felt like I was punished for being angry and for, for hitting someone. Um, and, and during this, I, the, my, my teacher kind of put a pillow over me and I screamed into this pillow for like a good minute or so. Um, and on the other side of that, I just felt this, this, beautiful, this beautiful release um, and just feeling that I was safe to express anger in a healthy way. Um, has been has been really really powerful for me and and, and so I, I think that what breathwork is for me is a bridge from our kind of conscious to our unconscious and it it shows up it, or it brings to the surface whatever micro or macro traumas we're we're ready to process and and for some people it, may, it might take months or even years to get to some of the the more deeply embedded things maybe it's you know a, a deep grief from from many many years ago that's been locked down um, but I, I just find it an absolutely fascinating process and it's something that I'm, I'm still only scratching the surface of in, in many ways. The example that you gave is really powerful because it sounds like that, that memory was like, you could argue like almost insignificant, but it mm-hmm. definitely was extremely significant, right? But at the time it was just one of those things that happened. It's just part of life. But then mm-hmm. you don't realize that what that makes you carry uh, moving forward um yeah that's really powerful and we we've run a few retreats high existence retreats mm-hmm. and the breathwork sessions that we've done i think the well the style is transformational breath mm-hmm. and that I, I see the the emotional release that people have from these sessions is people at the end of the retreat say that the breath work was more powerful than the ayahuasca often mm-hmm. you know it's like mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. no joke you don't think it but in, until you experience it you yeah like it mm. And just, 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 just to touch on that as well, um, something that my, my teacher at Dangerfield is currently doing research in is um, that during the breathwork journey, like when that release happens, the, the nervous system is actually rewiring your breathing pattern. And so often people will come to breathwork sessions and they, they might not be able to breathe fully into their belly or they may struggle to breathe into like the upper part of their lungs. And unlike with say ayahuasca or, or, or mushroom journeys where you may get profound insights and, and downloads and, um, and you know, memories can surface. But as far as I, as far as I know, nothing kind of changes physio- physiologically, but with breath work, you're, you're literally changing your breathing pattern in real time. And, and the way that you breathe then directly impacts the way that you kind of show up in life because our, our style of breathing affects our, our endocrine system and that, affects our brain our blood chemistry which affects our emotional states and so it really does have this um i I think very tangible effect on our day-to-day life whereas for me certainly um in some ayahuasca journeys it's been hard to integrate 
kind of the things that I've experienced and I've it's I've almost come away from it feeling like oh that was like a an incredible dream an amazing experience but I'm not really sure how I've mm. you know benefited from it in the long term yeah yeah I, I I resonate with that and yeah what comes up for me here is the 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 power of of your breath in daily life because a lot of us are just not conscious of our, of our breathing I've noticed that when I get a certain trigger I might hold my breath you know mm. which then creates this spiral of other things that happen and i've done i've done periods of longer meditation you know like an hour a day and i mm. and i always felt really good whenever i was doing this and i was thinking that it might not even be the meditation itself but the mm -hmm. fact that i'm sitting calmly and mm -hmm. nasal breathing with my mm -hmm. diaphragm for an hour like who does that right that alone is like <laughs> is yeah it's very calming Yeah, no, I know. Absolutely. And um, so I, I've also trained as a, a meditation teacher. Um, and I've I now my practice is now 50 percent breathing practice to, to kind of get my mind and brain to a state where the meditation feels conducive. But I because I, I feel like when we're especially if we have like monkey mind or we're, you know, up trying to get to sleep, it's very hard to influence the mind by using the mind. But by mm. using different breathing patterns, particularly if you if you're looking to activate the parasympathetic system and calm down the nervous system then having a a longer exhale and breathing into your belly um a ratio of, of two to one is good um then you'll very quickly drop into a state of, of parasympathetic and your thoughts will you know without you doing anything they will start to calm down they will start to slow down and if you do that for five ten even fifteen minutes you'll feel like meditation is almost easy afterwards And, or, or you'll be in a state where it just kind of comes naturally. Um, so that's been, uh, that's kind of been my approach in, in recent years. Do you have any, uh, re like, cause obviously people listening to this might be thinking, well, I, I'd love to learn more about breath work, but there's mm -hmm. so much about breath work now. Do you have any pointers for where people could start doing some research? Mm. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of, um, a lot of talk about breath work. I, I think I'd, I'd first separate it into two separate categories. Um, the first is the kind of like real time recovery. Say if you're at work and something has just triggered you or you're feeling stressed, then having those simple practices, um, it can just be as simple as a kind of as, as box breathing, which is um, in for, hold for, exhale for, hold for, or um, in for four and then out for eight. Um, Usually, as long as there's a longer exhale, then that will create a, a calming effect. Um, and then there's the, things like Wim Hof, things like the more intense, activating, energizing breathing, which is great for in the morning, great for kind of um, feeling that fire in your belly. And, and then there's the, the more transformational breath work, um, which I, I think it's, it's unfortunate that we use the same word because they're very, they're very different yeah. experiences. Um, so, I mean, there are there are a lot of resort of things out there on breathwork i would say um there's a book by stan groff that is particularly good he was kind of one of the the early pioneers of holotropic breathwork um and after he was after lsd was banned in the 60s um his book is is great um i also interviewed my my teacher ed Dan and ed dangerfield on my podcast and he has a really good kind of like hour-long intro to uh, his style of conscious connected breathing which is also trauma aware and he he has a background as a nervous system specialist so it's very grounded in science which i appreciate because i think there's a a danger of this getting into kind of the new age like woo space um mm -hmm. and i think that can be tough for some people um and let me see um yeah and, and then there's a couple of great books that have been published recently one is called the breathing cure by patrick McEwen, and he outlines I think 26 kind of very specific tactical breathing exercises for for certain effects so one will like un unstuff your nose um there's breathing to get to sleep kind of all of these very specific tactical practices and it's also very research backed as well and then for a more general overview the recent book by james nestor i think it's just called breath is also superb he, he's a great writer um and he really unpacks the benefits of of nose breathing specifically over mouth mouth breathing and I, i imagine most people like i did will immediately start taping their mouth when they sleep <laughs> after reading all of the effects of this i felt like a crazy person when i first put mouth tape and i i now use it every night um and yeah so i i'd say those would be good starting points 
Um, if I think of anything else, I'll, I'll send you an email with some links. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those I, so I've read breath and yeah, the, the nasal breathing during sleep with the mouth tape game changer, just like waking yep. up so much nice. more refreshed. Yeah. Nice. People are like, but isn't it dangerous? It's like, <laughs> you don't have to <laughs> seal your mouth shut, you know, it's like, you can leave a little bit of space if you need to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Those are really good. We'll put, put uh, links to all of those resources. So we, we've talked a little bit, Uh, about stoicism and stoicism is very popular now and one of the key ideas in stoicism is building resilience um Mm. by sort of thinking more rationally about your distorted view of reality which in Mm. turn causes suffering uh what are your thoughts on stoicism you've you've expressed that you have some some issues with it i'd love to hear what those are Mm. Mm. yeah um Okay, where to begin? Um, so what what just came to mind for me was, um, again, I, th- I think going back to this piece of like trying to change your your thoughts with your thoughts or trying to change the mind with the mind um, is certainly possible. But I, I feel like going into the body and using the wisdom of the body through things like like breathing practices to, to change to change your state is a far more efficient way to get to that desired outcome. Um, so I think I think that's something that that just comes to mind. And then with regards to stoicism more generally, um, yeah, I I haven't studied it um, to nearly the depth that you have, and so these may be unfounded criticisms. <laughs> but I, I think the, the impression that I've had from some people who are very kind of passionate about it is that there can be this sense of of almost unhealthy detachment from life um, and this idea of um, particularly in, in say the realm of uh, if, if we kind of go back to the subject of trauma um, if there is only this this witnessing of, of what's there without the kind of I, I feel like courage that it takes to to go into the experience and to feel whatever's there and to to trust the innate wisdom of the body. I, I, I have the sense that there is a very, um, there's a lot of value placed on rationality, which is, is, you know, obviously very important in life, but I think that there's, a, there's an equally important um, piece of embodied wisdom and, and kind of trusting the innate wisdom of the body in certain, uh, in, 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 in certain times and in having the, um, p- perhaps this is the key thing is like having the wisdom to discern when to listen to your your mind and, and the rational side of you and when to kind of trust your body and go with the, the you know the gut feelings and, and sense of the, sense of the heart so um, those are my thoughts there's there's it's not a particularly coherent case against stoicism but that's just what comes up yeah uh, well no that, that that was awesome and and I I agree so Jules Evans who I've interviewed on the podcast he wrote a book primarily on stoicism philosophy mm-hmm. for life but then he says that at the end of every book that he writes he kind of finds the kind of issues or the things he doesn't really like about the topic mm-hmm. that he's been working on because he's looked at it so closely mm-hmm. and so he went on to write a book called the art of losing control which is all about ecstatic experiences mm-hmm. and and yeah that's not really discussed in stoicism so i i definitely see those two two things being vital and mm. and my my approach to stoicism is i sometimes speak to people and they are like stoicism is this perfect philosophy and if you don't like it you've got a problem with it then it's your problem mm. and stoic you know and it's like that kind of that kind of framing and i think of it like if you if you discover a martial art and you put that martial art to use and you find weaknesses with it, you innovate and you make changes and you adapt it and you mm. grow it. So mm-hmm. that's what I'm interested in is, well, take stoicism and, and say, well, what are the problems with it? How can we change it and ultimately create something better? Um, mm. You know? Yeah. So that, that really resonates with me too. And what comes to mind is um, I, I recently interviewed a guy called Bill Plotkin, who is a wilderness kind of vision quest guide. And he has recently published a book called the, the Journey of Soul Descent or The Journey of Soul Initiation. And he talks about these, these kind of four facets of human development that are key to wholeness. 
and mm -hmm. what he calls the north facet are qualities that I would very much associate with stoicism in terms of how to be a good leader, how to you know, use the mind, how to um, kind of have strong will and determination and focus. But he then has the, the east, south and west facets. The east facet is kind of the traditional path to waking up, the kind of path to enlightenment. Um, and the south facet, the south and west, he says, are the two most underdeveloped. And the south is um, kind of our, our sense of wildness and our kind of animal primal nature um, and reconnecting to just reconnecting to those deeper emotions, which we often shame ourselves for having. Um, and, and that's it's kind of exemplified by this book called Iron John by Robert Bly. And he talked about how toxic masculinity is basically born from, from this disowning, this wildness in our nature and how it, it surfaces in, in shadowy ways. And then the, the West facet is more about um, kind of courting, he calls it the, the beloved muse, but it's like developing your relationship to creativity and working with dreams and kind of understanding those, those kind of darker shadowy aspects as well. So my, my sense is that the Stoics really nailed the kind of um, the North side, but I think that um, it's maybe incomplete based on, you know, other wisdom traditions out there. Yeah. Great. I'm looking forward to listening to that episode. Um, so your, your newsletter is always full of amazing resources and links. You do a lot of work online, um, but at the same time, you are grounded and you, you manage burnout and stress really well. A lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people struggle with, you know, the internet and mm -hmm. calmness. You know, there's this kind of two opposing forces pulling. Just wondering what your approach is to, you know, doing a lot of work online and but also remaining tranquil and free of over <laughs> distraction. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the first thing I say is that I'm definitely not, <laughs> I'm not immune to that either. Um, I think that I really, I've just learned to set pretty clear boundaries with with my time and my energy and, and particularly my attention. Um, and so for me, I now you know, have like the first two or three hours of the day are usually pretty, like pr pretty offline. Um, I'll do breath work, meditate, usually some kind of movement, then some kind of breathing and then some kind of meditation. And then I'll kind of plan my day and then have from like nine till lunchtime will be like my, my deep work time where I'll go online, I'll try and get something, try and create something good and then have a good break for lunch. And then the afternoon is where I kind of open the floodgates to responding to messages and emails, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, um, having conversations like this. And so I, I think that flow has really worked for me. But I, I think the main thing is really to just have this mindset of self-experimentation and trying different things, different routines, different practices, find out what really works for you. Um, and, and I think the most... Um, the main category that gets left out from these conversations i think is is around how, how do we rest how do we switch off how do we kind of down regulate our nervous systems once they've been stressed out um and so th there are two things that i think can be really helpful for this one is um breathwork journeys even shorter ones kind of 20 or 30 minutes um nose breathing can be also uh, slightly less intense but it will leave you very calm and the other mm -hmm. is um what Andrew Huberman calls non-sleep deep rest. It's also known as yoga nidra in the yogic traditions. And there's, there's many great uh, yoga nidra teachers out there. I love the work of Rod Stryker. Um, and these are essentially, um, it, 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 they're kind of like guided visualizations that guide you into a space of, of what they call waking sleep. He calls it enlightened sleep. And it's incredibly rejuvenative and nourishing for the body. And there's, there's studies that say that you can get kind of two to three hours worth of deep sleep in a 30 minute ninja practice. And so having those spaced out during the day, particularly kind of after lunch, sometimes I'll feel a bit sleepy. It gets quite hot here in Bali. So I'll, I'll take like a 30 minute ninja and then I'll get up and I'll just feel, feel better and feel kind of more, more alert. And, um, and, and then I guess I'll add to that, um, really cultivating awareness of your own body. So like, somatic self-awareness i think is is one of the most crucial pieces so that um if i am feeling under the weather if i'm feeling you know under rested if i push myself in a workout too much then the next morning i'll check in with myself and be like how am i feeling today and i will change my plans based on how i'm feeling 
Um, and there are obviously great tools out there like the Aura Ring and, and the Whoop Band and Apple Watch, which will give you kind of proxy measures using heart rate variability, which is a great, um, is a really helpful kind of proxy for your your heart's and your body's resilience at that time. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it's interesting. I've I've been wearing an Aura Ring for about a year now, and when I was moving around in Mexico and, and shifting shifting houses, there was there was a lot of chaos. My heart rate variability was around like 30 to 35 and in the last month it's gone up to like 90 to 95 um and i think that's just purely from getting back into a good routine having a good flow if you're fortunate enough to have access to to saunas or cold plungers they are fantastic um particularly at the end of the day um so th- there's, there's really lots of different practices I, I think it really involves um kind of finding out what works best for you and there's a there's an a online wiki that I created that's available at resilient.wiki that kind of lists a lot of these tools and practices that I've curated over the years. Um, so if people are feeling they're maybe on the edge of burnout or they're you know, just interested in this topic, then I'd, I'd check out that link. Awesome. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing that link. Uh, I'm looking forward to diving deeper into that. I've come across it before, but yeah, I've got a renewed interest in going into all of this again now. Cool. Um, so this is a bit of a left field question, but it's related to meditation. Uh, so like meditation nowadays is seen as this way to, is marketed at least to, to reduce stress and to sleep better and to become more calmer and happier. Mm-hmm. But then if you, if you look at more of like the ancient tra- tradition of meditation, the, the end goal would be insight you know like to see the true nature of reality Mm -hmm. and the things like less stress and and happiness might be seen as more just like a byproduct not the goal itself Mm -hmm. um so yeah just wondering what your thoughts are on that are you is insight and you know seeing the true nature of reality and awakening something that you are interested in or or not so much Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I certainly am fascinated by it, and um, so I'll, I'll maybe start with, yeah, so I'll start with saying that I think that the way meditation is marketed, I feel conflicted by it because I think in on the one hand it can be a great like a like like a Trojan horse, or it, it's almost like a, a trickster approach to getting people who would would never normally think about some of these deeper questions or investigate the nature of reality let's say Um, but if they commit to a meditation practice with sufficient intensity for a long enough period of time then the meditation practice will almost like often do the work for you particularly if they go into kind of longer retreats vipassana and things like that Um, so so i think it can be that framing can be a good gateway for people Um, and for myself I, i i had a couple of really powerful experiences on my first Vipassana meditation retreat. And, and I mm-hmm. think that since, since that retreat, my, uh, let's say my like rationalist worldview has slowly been chipped away at to the point where I, I now have a completely different perspective on what the, what the universe is, what it's made of and, and, and all of these things. And so um, I'm I'm currently being mentored by a guy called Andrew Taggart, who's a um, incredible uh, Zen philosopher, and and I think these questions are very alive for me. And and particularly, um, I I think of meditation as being almost like um, it can also be a, a form of training, and it depends on what what is it that you want to cultivate in yourself. Like, do you you could do meta meditation, for example, where cultivating heart openness and gratitude and and loving kindness to all beings i think that's like it's a fantastic practice there's meditation for for concentration there's um and and as you say some of the more deeper meditations particularly zen say where the focus is is on this moment of of insight this moment of of kensho um or or the kriya meditations which are very popular here in bali which are more around from the tantric traditions of, of moving working with energy and moving it up your spine to create these kind of experiences of what they call samadhi which are these like miniature moments of enlightenment where the for an instant the the true nature of reality reveals itself um and i think that once you once you start to experience some of these altered states of consciousness whether it's through meditation or entheogens or or breath work um it just i mean for me it's just been 
fascinating. And I think that I've experienced some of those places through plant medicine. And for me, the, the interesting question or the adventure is to kind of get there under my own steam through the practice of, of meditation and, and working with the breath. Um, so for me, it, so it can become more consistent and reliable and more integrated in my day to day life as well. Yeah. 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 I like that approach a lot. And what you said at the end really resonates when I, whenever I've had a, a psychedelic experience that has been meaningful, the one takeaway I've consistently had is I want to meditate more. Yeah. You know, I want to <laughs> get back to my meditation practice. You know, that's been the, the real, like it's been, a, if, if nothing else, a motivator to, mm. to the spiritual path. Mm. Um, mm. Like my, my first psilocybin trip, I remember just sitting there and thinking like, wow, the Buddha, <laughs> he knew some things, you know, <laughs> like this is uh, <laughs> starting to make a bit more sense now. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I think that most, or a lot of people have this, this kind of turning point, um, I, I did a a ten day retreat in a dark room at the end of last year, and kind of halfway through that, I almost dropped into a state where I wanted to meditate. Like there was nothing more. Um, th 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 there was a sense of like having a smile come to come to wear me. I just couldn't stop smiling. There was this this sense of bliss and the sense of like deep happiness that was there for absolutely no reason at all. Like it just it just came to me. Um, and, and I think this idea of, of like, instead of reaching for these, these states with, with more money or, you know, successful businesses, things like that, like we can, we can feel the way that we want to feel. We can access these deep states of bliss and gratitude and happiness just by learning to kind of work with our mind. And that to me feels like an incredibly essential part of the human experience. And so... That, that I think is what is driving a lot of my, my interest in my personal practice and the people that I'm talking to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So totally resonate with that. You've mentioned a couple of times uh, during this conversation that you, you've got different mentors. Just, mm -hmm. I'm just curious about uh, like, what do you, uh, just so you, just your general thoughts on the value of mentorship and how you go about finding mentors. Hmm. Yeah, so I think I'm, again, kind of touching on the point of not really having many role models when I was younger. Um, and, and I think initially, the, the pod, my podcast was probably started kind of consciously or unconsciously out of this desire to, to find mentors. And, and, you know, a podcast is a great excuse to have a 90-minute a conversation with someone that you aspire to mentor you. Um, and... Yeah, in, in the in the last few months, I've been working with um, this guy, this guy Andrew, for who, who kind of he, he has what he calls a philosophical uh, philosophical practice, and it's kind of a process of, of inquiry. Um, I have someone like a, a creativity mentor who also works with mature masculinity, and and I think that having um, like we we really need to have uh, often older people who are further down the path than we are um, in order to help us to um, just kind of bring those aspects of ourselves alive. And it's obviously, like, I think books can be great mentors. Or there's many audio books where the authors I would consider mentors to, to some degree. And I, I sometimes have this, um, this might even have been a stoic practice, but I'll sometimes have imaginary, imaginary conversations with authors. I'll have, like, another chair or even two chairs opposite me and just imagine what that person would say if they were sitting and the advice is almost super it's often very accurate it's very superb um and so i think i think mentorship is really really important um and in terms of finding the right mentor it's it, it's very I, i don't think it's formulaic i don't think there's there's any um one way to do it i think it, it really comes with like tapping into your desire to grow in that specific area and then um, kind of putting that intention out into the world um, and not being afraid to, to start new conversations, to maybe reach out to authors and say, you know, this your work really helped me and resonated with me in these ways um, and just be willing to approach people and to ask people questions. And if the relationship of mentorship emerges from that, 
um, then I, th- I think it's a beautiful thing. And, and there's obviously people out there who also are, are kind of like paid coaches as well. And I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of very questionable um, like coaches out there, but I think there's a lot of great ones as well. And so again, just being able to discern who, who can help support you in, in the journey that you're on. Yeah, on just a practical level, when you do meet someone who you do find can can mentor you and and there's a, a solid relationship, is there a conversation that you have that that makes it explicit, or is it more just this unspoken arrangement mm. that happens? Yeah, I've I've done it both ways. Um, obviously, it's explicit if they if they if they charge for their time and it's something you know they do. Um, it's one of their income streams. Then yeah. it's obviously explicit. Um, in the times where it's more informal, um, often there'll more just be a, a kind of uh, like like checking in, like are you are you, are they getting something from this conversation? Is this something that they're you know enjoying as well, and they're they're happy to continue? And then if there is more, let's say like aliveness in the inquiry, or um, I've had a couple of business mentors over the years as well who've just been kind of who I'd now consider to be friends who have just been willing to hop on a hop on a call for an hour and a half once a month and just kind of just as a check-in and just for me to kind of um sense check what I'm up to and and in those cases it's kind of explicit for a set period of time let's say we do it for kind of three months or six months and then we'll just see like is this still you know are we still being filled up by this if so let's continue if not then um just leave it there and so I, I think it um it can work both ways um, i i would be hesitant to kind of formalize or name something too quickly and, and to kind of grasp onto yeah. that idea of like you will be my mentor because i think that the, the the energy behind that would potentially put someone off wanting to actually help you yeah um, and, and and i i think the other important thing to name here is that many people who we look up to um it for whatever reason they will have often had mentors who've helped them so there will be this kind of deeper part of them that wants to pay that forward and wants to kind of repay that to the next the next generation and so if they see some of themselves in you or in your journey there will often be like an innate kind of desire and and willingness to to help out there um so yeah does that does that answer (laughs) Yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it does answer it. And it's clearing up some things for me because I, I have people in my life that I look up to and that they, they're they there for me to, to ask questions and to to check in with. But I've never really framed it in my mind as uh, they are my mentors. And now if I start to do that, I feel like there's a lot more value that 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 can be provided for, for both of us. And not that it needs to be said even, but just... Uh, just mm-hmm. like a, a recognition that oh yeah they th- these are mentors of mine and and uh, mm-hmm. I value them as such people that's that's actually like a very nice thing yeah um, and, and and something I've done in the past is, has been like write letters to people who've played that role in my life and just like really thanking them for like what they've what they've given to me and what they've contributed and um, yeah so so I guess having that lens of mentor might help with the the appreciation that comes from the relationship as well yeah for sure yeah that that that's really powerful um so yeah i'm i'm mindful of the time um i know you're in bali how is bali uh going you've been there for a it few is, weeks it is um it's beautiful in the uh, we're in the dry season right now um we're currently yeah. under a two-week lockdown so um everything's closed down for probably another 10 days maybe longer um but other than that, we've we've actually adopted our, our landlord's puppy, Carla, and so it's been <laughs> been really nice having <laughs> puppy energy running around. And yeah, we're really fortunate to have a kind of spacious little oasis of a villa here, um, not too far from the sea. So we're very happy here, and it's it's been a good excuse for us to get into our creative flows as well. Um, so yeah, Bali's Bali's great. What do you have coming up uh, in the pipeline? I know we, we've talked briefly. You have some some exciting things happening. You, you're going to be having some transitions. Where can people fi- keep up to date with the work you're doing and yeah, and and just get all of that good stuff? Yeah. So the best the best place is honestly just the newsletter. Um, it's Johnny.life or newsletter.curiousumans.com. Um, 
and that's where I'll be kind of sharing a lot of the updates. The main things that I'm working on right now are this this course on nervous system resilience. That's a, a kind of five week training that'll be bringing together as much of the the science and and protocols around breath work and other things that I've been working with for the last few years. And I'm going to keep on with the podcast. Um, that's definitely my my passion project for now. Um, again, Curious Humans can be found on most podcast apps. And I'm hoping to run a retreat later this year in Bali that's going to be combining breath work with archetypes. Um, but it's going to be slightly depending on, on the COVID situation, but hopefully sometime in, in December or maybe January next year. Um, so that, I'm excited sounds so that good. as well. <laughs> yeah, that sounds so good. Um, yeah, so at, at High Existence, we, we're all fans. Um, me, Eric, Mike Slavin, who, who's a friend of yours. We're, we're all fran- mm-hmm. fans of the newsletter. Um, the, the podcast is amazing. I think I'm, I'll, I'll speak to you later about maybe you can give me like your top five episodes that we can put in, in the show notes for this sure. article. Yeah, there's, there's actually, there's also an episode with, with Mike as well. I think that was a, was a juicy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, even though we've only been speaking just over an hour, you've given a lot of different rabbit holes for me to go down. Um, cool. There's a lot of different names and ideas. So I appreciate that. I'm really looking forward to going into it. And I'll put the links to everything you've mentioned in the article that goes with this. And so if anyone wants to look at that and get more information, we can we can do that. So, yeah, thank you so much, Johnny. I appreciated the conversation. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much as well, John. This has been, it's been really fun. Um, and I really hope we get a chance to meet in person sometime. Thank you for listening to the High Existence Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support us, then please subscribe and review the podcast and we'll keep trying to get guests and episodes of this quality in the future. Speak to you soon, fate permitting.